Let's talk about intermolecular forces and phases of matter. Here's the essential question. Get out your science notebook and let's write this at the top of the page. How do intermolecular forces help to explain the different phases of matter? In order to talk about the two, we need a first review about electronegativity and dipoles. If you recall, electronegativity is an atom's ability to attract electrons. Now we can use the periodic table to get the general idea of how much ele electronegativity an element has compared to other elements. Elements of the upper right hand corner, such as fluorine, have a high, high electronegativity compared to elements in the lower left hand corner. And it's a gradient throughout the periodic table, depending on how much they have. So here is an example where hydrogen and fluorine are attached to one another based on a covalent compound. Now hydrogen and fluorine have created a dipole, partially charged ends because of unequal sharing. You can see here that fluorine being a higher electronegativity attracts those two electrons that they're supposed to be sharing to itself a little bit more. This causes fluorine to have a partial not a full, but a partial negative charge. Remember, they're still sharing the electrons. Fluorine hasn't taken those electrons, but because they're attracted to itself a little bit more, it has a partial negative charge. As a result, hydrogen has a partial positive charge as well. So what is an intermolecular force? Well, we often abbreviate intermolecular forces as IMFs. And intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules. In fact, the word inter, the prefix inter means between. Think of like an interstate takes you between two states. Intermolecular forces are the forces between two molecules. Now, most intermolecular forces are based on dipoles. They're based on attraction between the two partial charged ends. And so here you can see, for example, we have a hydrogen molecule, or sorry, a water molecule. Now this water molecule is held between oxygen and hydrogen. And I want to point out that this bond right here between oxygens and the hydrogen, this is a covalent bond. It's a very strong bond within that molecule. But this water molecule having dipoles, those partial positive and partial negative ends can be attracted to the partial positive and partial negative ends of other water molecules. These forces of attraction, these dotted lines right here, are intermolecular forces or the forces between the molecules that causes an attraction between them. Now, intermolecular forces are fairly weak forces. We can break them with common tools that we just have around us. Covalent bonds and ionic bonds, on the other hand, are very strong forces. They're harder to break. I want to give you an analogy of intermolecular forces. Here we have a Lego brick, and this Lego brick represents a molecule. Now, this Lego brick is made from fused plastic, and it's very hard to break, practically impossible with the tools that I have. But I can take this one molecule and I can snap it to another molecule with kind of a weaker force between them. In fact, these weak forces are at least strong enough to hold a substance together. And so substances are held together because of their intermolecular forces. All right, we have this chart in our notebook. We wrote it in a previous module. Let's go ahead and find this chart right now because we're going to add to it. We can classify matter not only based on composition, but we can classify matter based on the state or the phase that it is in. Those are the two of the same words. Now, states and phases are basically a relationship between the IMFs and the speed or the movement of those particles. So let's go ahead and explore the different parts. You're probably familiar with the states and phases of matter. The four we're going to talk about are solids, liquids, gases, and plasma. And so here on this page, I have both macro level models and micro level models, as well as how intermolecular forces and kinetic energy relate to them. Let's start with solids. Solids are typically particles that are held compact or tightly bound together. They have a large density because they're really tightly packed. Now the intermolecular forces between these particles are really strong. They're close together, they're held together tightly. But the energy of these particles are very low. They're not moving very fast. They're very typically slow. Now liquids on the other hand have less strong 
IMFs. Their intermolecular forces are starting to degrade and the particles are starting to spread apart. And that's due to the fact that the energy has increased. These molecules are able to flow around each other a lot more. They still kind of hang out near the lower end of the container because gravity still has an effect on them, but they're able to flow and move around each other. Now, with more energy, we can cause an even weaker amount of intermolecular forces. In fact, when we reach gas stage, the intermolecular forces are practically gone. These particles are moving around so much, they don't have enough time and enough stability to be able to attract each other. So these particles spread out and take up the entire container or the entire room. They have a lot more energy. By the time we get to the plasma phase, there is so much energy in these particles that these particles rip apart their, pro, their positively charged parts, their nucleus and their negatively charged electrons clouds separate from each other because there's so much movement, so much kinetic energy that literally there's a cloud of positive and negative charge, which is why plasma is often seen as like lightning or electricity or intense amounts of heat. Now, plasma on Earth is not a very common phase of matter, but in the universe, plasma is the most common phase of matter as we see a nebula and stars and other things. So going back to our classifying matter flow chart, let's go ahead and add our different phases and states to our flow chart, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma, as well as draw some micro level particle models. I also like to point out that we increase the energy going from solid to plasma. Now, just to end, we can change phases. In fact, we saw that before as we took our ice and we went to water, to liquid water and we went to a vapor and eventually plasma. But all of our different substances can go through different phase changes. And the way they do that is by adding or removing energy, typically in the form of heat. In fact, in this chart, you'll see the word enthalpy. And enthalpy is just another way to say heat energy. And we'll learn about that a little bit later. But these are the different phases as well as the different phase definitions. You probably know going from solid to liquid is melting, but going from liquid back to solid, we're taking away the heat energy and we're causing that to freeze. In winter, you're probably familiar with snow. Now, snow is a solid form, but near the end of winter, that snow sublimates directly to a gas. A lot of it does. Some of it melts to a liquid, but a lot of it goes straight to a gas by sublimate, sublimation. And so here are the different phase changes and the different definitions to go along with that. That leads us to the end of our notes. Take a moment to review and highlight key terms, ponder and ask questions, and summarize and answer the essential question. Good luck.